we will uh, consider to actually compute whether we are making uh, we are we are whether we are as per our wear time requirement or not by the way in viva some of you could not answer the basic question that what do we mean by wear time requirement so just these are very basic when we are talking about embedded system or embedded communication or cyber physical system wear time requirement means you are having a fixed deadline and you have to complete your task within that fixed deadline it is nothing related to you have to complete something very fast nothing related to you have complete something very slow or something like that it is like real time means just in time you have to meet the deadline sometimes meet the, i mean failure to meet the deadline can be catastrophic and that those types of deadlines we consider as hardware time sometimes uh, i mean failure of meeting the deadline may lead some what to say delay or uh, decrease in your performance that's all that time we consider the system serves as software time but whether whatever be the case most of the time whenever we talked about embedded system design or we work in embedded system scenario every time we consider this requirement that we have we are time bounded we have fixed deadline within which we have to complete everything complete our task now so far we have talked about separate separate small embedded system design now we will see one example we will in embedded communication mean here we are considering how my two embedded system will talk to each other how will they communicate now when we are talking about a uh, communication initially what we mean i mean by our uh, historical knowledge first concept of communication i mean technical in a technical way we can think about telephony and that was also in one sort of embedded because when we thought about embedded embedded means itself it is for a particular defined task for one particular perspective so in the way initially when telephony was proposed that time it was for one one purpose single purpose that is for voice communication but later on with the onset of internet we merged the, that part with everything we merged that communication with data transfer data communication video communication everything and that way the communication itself became a complex topic and when we talk about embedded communication we will see more what are the different challenges we have faced and what are the different solutions we can propose and what are the different protocols maybe in this is a you know understand it is a fundamental course so just we will take a few hours to discuss about this embedded communication not much we have another separate elective embedded communication networks there we discuss as a whole what type of uh, different protocols are there and what type of challenges we face now for embedded communication let's start with this basic example see here we have given example of an a uh, scenario of an industrial automation where there are different cps nodes no just second there are different C cps nodes and they are forming some machine center that cps nodes if we consider collectively they are forming some manufacturing cell or cps units then those cps units collectively they are forming some cps system that is useful that is for maybe uh, computing controlling monitoring for everything in industrial automation scenario now this example shows that so far whatever we have talked about small small modeling small fold de design requirements but actually whenever we are talking about cps system design related issues 
that is not that we are just designing or just talking about one single small cps component we are talking about basically a whole network cps based network embedded system network and so when we are coming thinking about communication we have to think about both we have to th think about how we can communicate between smaller cps components also we, uh, how we are going to communicate when we are cons considering those same cps uh, components in a larger account okay so both things we have to consider let's take another example this is an example in an automotive scenario you can see nowadays in our automobiles or smart cars they are equipped with different types of features and basically they are i mean um, they are formed of different ecus now those ecus those controlling units computation units they will basically they should talk to each other otherwise when you are pressing the brake what are the consequences that information should be passed from one ecu to another now you can see just for one simple example for different parts of the car for different functionalities you are having different types of um, um, embedded communication protocols some are using ethernet some are flex phase some are can most there are different types of protocols so that means one single smart card one typical example within that there you have to use different types of protocols due to their different requirements things become more complex when these smart smart card is becoming the part of your cps iot framework that is also an extension of your embedded system based a embedded system feature based uh, scenario embedded system feature based development so here what happens here some communication protocols you need to have what is working within that smart card now that the the same smart card is maybe talking to some uh, vehicular network maybe talk entering into some of uh, we have also taken some example of smart parking lot there the billing information how much there the, the are two things are taking place one the count that how much time your car is within that um, uh, counter uh, within that gar garage or within that parking lot and how whether there are any vacant parking lot or uh, slots or lot, um, parking places are there or not and if your car is actually getting some place within that parking lot the time calculation how much time the you have actually kept your car inside that uh, space and then based on that some deduction from your credit or debit card that will take take is automatically when you will take your car out from that parking place so everything nowadays is controlled by this iot or cps uh, based systems and underlying for every these type of frameworks basically your embedded systems embedded communications are working so you can of course understand the protocol that is working for that is communicating between your uh, media ecu and your maybe uh, steering or brake ecu the same protocol of course you cannot use the when your credit card is communicating based on your car sensors it is co communicating to some cloud based framework cloud based server and your money is getting deducted so there are different types of requirements when we are thinking about embedded system based applications and that's why embedded communication itself is a uh, i mean uh, is a uh, is a subject is a separate subject to study so here what for in the subject what are the challenges we are trying to answer we are trying to answer how we are going to handle this heterogeneity first of all there are different types of requirements different type of bandwidth new data transfer rates everything is different how we are going to handle this heterogeneity next which language to choose to talk like here we have given one example of flexway let's forget this example as of now because we will take this example later on when you will 
you will get matured and habituated with the subject. But the main idea is, whenever you are, you understood so far that uh, F1 method system, you have some real time requirement. Some task, if some sensor is getting activated, immediately you have to perform some task in your embedded system. The, those are event-driven tasks, event-based tasks, and some are very routine tasks. So it is, of course, you can, I hope, understand that if you handle both the tasks in the same way or with, in the same channel, it may happen that to complete your routine task, sometimes you are design if you are not designing your uh, system properly sometimes you require real time task real task with real time requirements they may lose the uh, resources they may cannot finish their what uh, the requirements that they cannot finish the task within time so <clears throat> of course based on your requirement you have to choose which language you should talk and the Requirements are also very spurious. It is not very specific. You don't know when that event will come, but based on that, 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 that with that unpredictability, you have to plan everything. So that way, how you can actually find the best real-time protocol. Then we will come one by one, the collision handling in media access. That means when you have chosen a, chosen a protocol which is one-to-one, -one, very dedicated from point to point. That is fine. But when you have you are trying to reduce some wear connection, you're reducing some cost based on your requirement, and you are moving some shared media, maybe that we will discuss in the next day, not today. There are some concept of collision and how we are going to handle that. We will discuss this later, later with, I mean, in detail. Next. When you are sending your data from source to destination, how will you ensure that your um, communication or your transmitted data, how the receiver will understand that whatever you from sender, you have sent it, that is the same thing the receiver is receiving. So there should be some error detection or error correction mechanism, if possible, should be associated with your protocol. And then the security, of course, that is a very critical thing, but not in this course, we are not going to discuss. That is how you will ensure that whatever you are actually transmitting, this is wrong, how, whatever you are actually translating from source to destination, that is secure enough, that is not leaking. If you are actually sending your credit card information from cloud to your, from your credit card to your banking server, how will you ensure that it is going in a very secure way and no one is going to read that information, is not capable of reading that information, not capable of using that information in the future. So that is um, entirely a separate discussion. But at least when we study embedded communication or we study embedded communication scenarios in, in different ways, we basically try to answer these type of questions. Okay. So when that uh, told that when we are talking about embedded communication, there are two types of communications possible. One is point to point, that is the data links. That means we are considering each nodes are connected to each other. That is, there is some dedicated connection. And if the connection is dedicated, that means that is, of course, reliable. But you understand, you have multiple huge number of nodes in that scenario. To make such dedicated communication possible, that requires huge cost. So sometimes we use shared media. Some Most of the times we use the shared media networks. and. There we will actually this part we will discuss the some challenges related to collision related to error handling. So how we are handling those things. So another concept is and the challenge when you are talking about embedded system is that you have two types of communication that you should handle. One is event driven that I have told some event is occurring and based on that you have to perform some communication. On the other hand, some continuous state message from a um, um, node, you are just 
routinely transferring from one node to another. These are the two different types of communications possible. But we know that event driven means you are basically saving the network bandwidth. Whenever required, it may happen that sometimes an event is taking place and maybe time T0, the event is taking place and T0 to maybe T5, the, there is no event. At that time, there is a possibility that you can continuously send the state of the node. That means you can, for T0, you can send a signal uh, informing that, okay, that event has been taken and take the necessary action. Then from T1 to T5, maybe you are constantly sending that no event has been taken place. But that is, of course, some wastage of network bandwidth and there is no point of sending such type of, uh, what to say, void message, void state information. In case of when your scenario is mostly event driven, like we have seen in case of our modeling, we have seen the same thing in case of our um, parking lot example. Whenever the car is entering or going out, that time one event is taking place and that only that time the information is important to update your counter value. No point sending the rest of the time, the every time the state of the nodes. So that is the thing that when we are going for an event event uh, communication, we are saving the network bandwidth. But what is the flip side? The every message becomes important. That means for every message, you have to take care of this error and reliability that if there is a failure and some message is lost based on that message, the event based activity will not be taken place in your system. So every message is important. On the other hand, if you are going for state based communication, every time you are constantly sending the state based uh, state information of the node. In that case, you know that fixed size message will go from one point to another. You know how to schedule that. You know your network load is fixed. So the design in this case is very easy, very predictable. Whereas in if in event driven case, when the event will occur, that prediction is not easy. So that's that way. How you will actually schedule the resources? How you will define the intervals? Everything is not so pre-specified. Okay, so those are the challenges and advantages of event-driven and state-based communication. But the important part is, in, when you are going for embedded scenario, you have to take care of both. Because there is no perfect, I mean, scenario where you can say, okay, I have just only event-driven cases, or I have just only um, real-time, I mean, uh, routine, uh, routine uh, communications that's all so most of the cases we need the amalgamation of both the things event driven and state driven and in that cases it is difficult to design any real time protocol why because for real when you are talking about event driven case it is giving you the flexibility okay or sorry, efficiency, that is net network efficient. And when also in case of event driven, it is very flexible. Uh, so in case of um, uh, state based, it is very predictable. So somewhere you are getting efficiency, somewhere if you are going for predictability, you are losing the network efficiency. Whenever you are going for network efficiency, you are losing the predictability. So that way, this is the main challenge when we are talking about embedded communication, that how can I get the real-time protocol? So whatever we do, it is obvious we will miss something. But everywhere you will see some uh, real-time scheduling scenarios also that run uh, in, in later classes. So everywhere, it is basically some optimization problem how much of what you will choose and based on that you will define your protocol okay now before we will go to the specific um, embedded communication protocols before that this is a very i mean what to say basic framework more i think if whoever has done that 
um, any course or any information you have got any information related to communication or networking they know this osi model okay so open systems interconnection model this is a very fundamental model that is describing the functions of any networking system okay so in the model what we have we have, we have defined our task we have actually divided our task in few layers and in that layer we have specified what all we have to do step by step in application layer means this is providing an interface for data transfer from your application okay next the presentation layer where you are actually presenting the data representing the data in such a format that can actually be processed in the next levels then session means you are actually whenever you are doing communication between let's say one node to another i can say source to uh, oh, sorry client to server in that case some session will be provided within which you have to communicate we have to complete and that way the communication session will be handled and established by the session then there comes this three nodes transport network and data link okay. for all this no uh, sorry three layers transport layer network layer and data link layer now this transport layer um, no. each of them basically sending data is taking the responsibility of sending data from one port to another but only in case of data link it is for node to node transfer you are just considering one node to node one node two nodes and you are considering the transfer from node to node then with multiple nodes you have seen the example the first example we have talked about in with that multiple nodes maybe you have defined some networks so network layer is the is responsible for one network to another network communication so there are different strategies different algorithms routing protocols there are different just in this uh, fundamental discussion i'm just giving you the idea when you constructing with some nodes different networks the network layer as name suggests it is taking care of the communication from one network to another network and this transport layer layer is basically is for port to port communication from one port to another port so one way or other these three layers they all are basically responsible for communicating from one part to another part and these three they are basically accepting the data and representing the data and setting the environment for communicating the data okay this lns map we will discuss next day no ask it now <clears throat> next comes the physical layer now this physical layer as a next name suggests how you are actually performing the bit level transmission basically you know that whenever this in digital media you are the transfer is taking place it is coming to some bit level so you have some message in your application you are writing some message you are transferring some message so how you are coming from application to physical how these message is getting splitted into some bits or collection of bits and what more other than your data what more you are adding to those bits what will be the bit rate all these things are taken care of by by this physical layer so this is the main concept uh, i mean the most basic concept of networking system okay so any questions so far then we will go to the embedded protocols anyone ma yes ma'am you uh, ma'am please give the example of Pardon? physical data rate data rate okay. you are saying that physical layer data rate yes ma'am data rate in physical layer i will come into it that okay. data rate means 
how maybe how many bits per second you are transferring? Let's consider this as of now. We'll talk about baud weight. There are many terms. Okay. Yes, ma'am. The the first thing is how many how many bits per second you are maybe sending from sender to receiver. That is defining your data rate. Okay. So that way you are actually um, uh, considering these features, and uh, that th that part is controlled by your physical layer. Any other question? Yes. Later you will tell uh, how the system will be implemented. Yes, I will tell. I will take your example of protocols one by one. We will discuss CAN in detail and yes. some other protocols also. Yes. Okay. Next. Okay, so this is a basic idea of OSI model. So in embedded communication protocol, what is going on? You know, so for that part, you know that you have um, some embedded software specification that you have modeled. Then you have chosen some processor. You have some processing unit. Some processing unit. That processing unit, uh, the processor or controller is taking the input from the physical world. Okay, this is your CPU maybe, and it is doing some processing. And once the processing that that uh, input may be coming from some sensor, some something else, some other input bus, anything is possible. And then it is providing the output maybe some other peripheral. So this is your scenario. So you know up to this part, we already talked about how to come up to this part. Now we are talking in these parts, how we are receiving data, how we are communicating data. For So for that also, we need some protocols. Protocol means what? Some set of rules. Those set of rules will allow the communication between two embedded devices, and ultimately, that communication will take place through some bit level. Ultimately, you are transferring bits, nothing else. So whenever we are talking about communication protocols, we will discuss a few after this. So you will see that what you will expect, what we are actually discussing in that mostly in that protocol protocols. We will see those are mostly associated with physical layers and data link layers mainly in especially in case of embedded communication we will talk about that how they are um, they are actually working in that physical layer and data link layer because we will not consider much about that transport or networking layers those are i mean fused we consider that fused within that data link layer then the signals import incorporated what are the signal strengths how you are actually sending the data Handshaking, I will explain this if you do not know this. Then bus abbreviation. That means whenever multiple components are accessing a single bus or sharing some bus, who will take the control of that bus? And how the control will be, I mean, what to say, established. So those things we talked about in the bus abbreviation. Then maybe one component, there's a, pro, a possibility that from one component, you can send data to some multiple components. Then how will you actually define that addressing? How will you, how your, the sender will actually define to which receiver it will send the data or whatever data it is sending, which receiver will actually accept that, okay? Whether it is a word or wireless, then what are the data lines and how the data lines look like, how the data frames look like, etc. So based on that, we will be defining different communication protocols. And mostly you will see by some way or other in most of the protocols, we will be just discussing these features, these words. OK, now one thing, if you do not know this handshake, what does it mean? What do we mean by handshaking in our networking scenario. The handshaking means it is sometimes required for synchronization. Here the example is given for synchronization. Like you have two nodes, okay? One possibility is that your communication is synchronous. That means 
all the nodes are connected with some simple uh, i mean from a uh, with a single clock and that thing the clock is taking care of your synchronization because that means whenever your sender is sending some data to the receiver receiver should be ready to accept that data okay otherwise it may happen that your sender is sending some data and receiver is not receiving the, that or receiver is receiving but receiver doesn't know that how to understand it, that data so that way synchronization may be lost but if you are in the synchronous scenario with uh, i mean clock synchronous scenario i should say then in that case you are some you are having common clock which is considering that taking care of the synchronization issue here if not you are actually sending some synchronous signal from host a to server and that so i mean maybe this is the sender and the receiver this host way is actually initiating the uh, your uh, communication so that synchronous signal is sent to the server and server is syncing with the host and sending the acknowledgement yes i'm in sync with you and then host a is sending the signal okay i have received your sync acknowledgement now we can transfer the data we can start the data communication so this process where your source and destination is coming i mean um, into a uh, at same pace maybe now they are ready for data sending and receiving that mechanism is called handshaking so different there are different types of handshaking uh, two ways we were not going into that but just you, you should have the idea here handshaking means that we are keeping making everything in peace next we will broadly consider these two types of protocols the first one is intersystem protocol okay in intersystem protocol we establish communication communication between two communicating devices like you have your pc it is doing something you have your microprocessor or microcontroller and you are co communicating with your microcontroller or microprocessor with your pc through some communication protocol one we will talk about usb communication urt so these are different communication so these type of communication protocols are also required next intra system okay in this inter system that basically inter within the components you are doing the communication now this inter system is very critical because how much number of co components you are connecting based on that that increases the co complexity increases the power request requirement everything so mostly there are here a few protocols those are used within intra system so we will come into can in detail but before that we will discuss these protocols one by one one second we will discuss these protocols whatever we have mentioned here whatever we have discussed this usb we will be this usb urt i to see spi those protocols and then we will come to cam okay so these protocols the link is given i will uh, actually upload i, I have all, already uploaded this um another uh, file in this drive link so you can go there and you can find the details of this other the details of this related to other protocols okay. so okay So we can see. 
So whenever we are talking about data transmission, we have three options. One is simplex, one is half duplex, one is full duplex. You can see when we are talking about simplex, this is just one single way transmitted to receiver communication. One way. In half duplex, data is transmitted into both the directions. You can have some transmissions from transmitter to receiver or receiver to transmitter, but one at a time. Okay. In full duplex, you can actually transmit in the both ways at the same time. So we will we will see these uh, what to say protocols. Those are using some of these features. Mostly they are full duplex. Whatever we will be discussing on the I two C, sometimes we will see that is half duplex. So this is the basic of the protocols. We will go one by one. Okay. Okay. Someone is asking about the a data transfer rate. So you can find here, this is the concept of bond wet. What happened? Yes, this is the concept of bond wet. So this is a data transfer wet in serial communication. Okay, you can check it. Okay. Next, we will start our discussion with UART. Okay. You <clears throat> so this is asynchronous receiver and transmitter. So as the name suggests, they are transmit in UART communication. We are transmitting data in asynchronous way. Asynchronous means we will see there is no block associated with it. So how the tra um, transmission and receiving is taking place for any U US uh, I mean UART module you can see two pins transmitter and receiver and transmitter is sending to receiver receiver and another for UART two also transmitter is sending to receiver that so actually we will see how this transmission is taking place. Whenever we are thinking about two URT modules, they have their own transmitter and receiver pins. And what type of data is exchanged? Whenever one URT is receiving any parallel data, okay, it is transmitting the data in form of serial communication. And what they are forming? They are forming a data frame. In that data frame, we are considering one start bit. That means whenever this receiver will receive this frame, it will understand the first frame. That is my only start frame. And that start bit is not related to my valid data. It is not for my actual data. Next, these are my five to nine data bits. This is my this is mainly for error detection. That means parity means what? Whatever data bits this transmitter is sending to this receiver, the odd or even parity is possible. So it is the count of the ones possible. And it is checking whether uh, if generally uh, URT works in uh, maybe odd parity, so you are counting the numbers of one and you are putting the parity bits here. Now, in the receiver side, it may happen during the course of transmission, one or two mod um, data bits are getting modified. So, if some one is getting due to some noise or due to some other inference, that one bit is getting modified to zero, then this parity, there will be a mismatch between the whatever parity that this transmitter has sent to the receiver and whatever parity that receiver is actually seeing and whatever data it is actually receiving. So when the receiver will calculate the parity for the received data, there will be immediate mismatch and the receiver will understand that there is some modification of data during the course of transmission. And the data will get 
there will be um, the, the receiver can immediately reject the data or send some acknowledgement uh, the mentioning that to receive the data so there are different pro protocols associated with it but the main idea is this parity bit is for error detection if any change takes place in the transmission data during the course of transmission this parity bit helps to check um, uh, I mean, check the, I, or identify that error. Next, this is the transmission states. You are having the, you are not adding this chart bit, you can see, to your actual data frame. Then you are adding this parity and then you are adding one added stop bit. So that this is the format. That is the defined, predefined format that is taking place between the sender and the receiver so that the receiver should know when I should stop. And if, because whenever the receiver is receiving, it is 1010 10 continuous frames, right? So it should understand specifically after which bit there is a stop bit. And from next one, it will, from next some one or zeros, if it is receiving, it will expect one zero, that is the start bit. And after that, it will next consider the data frame. So that way the transmission takes place. So this is the transmission side and the receiving side. Okay. So this is a very simple protocol. And we can see the advantages are that you are only using two ways. Two ways, of course, asynchronous, no clock signal is there. Parity bit is there too, as I have already mentioned, error checking. So these are the advantages mostly. What is the dis disadvantage? The size of data frame, you are actually limiting to nine bits, okay? This is one, but the major one is, if you have to send, if one component in your, think about your complex scenario, when you have one master, one master, and they are sending multiple data to multiple states. So in such scenario, this URT communication is not very much suitable. So for that master slave scenario, when one is actually initiating the communication and the other is actually receiving, and there are possibility of multiple slaves, etc. We will see the next protocol with all these strategies. So that time in those scenarios, this type of protocol is not very much suited. So that's why this is uh, this URT, though very simple, though very um, important, but it is very limited in terms of application. Then we come to the SPI communication protocol. Okay, where we see we have the concept of master and slave. Okay, so you will see this MOSI and uh, MISO. MOSI means Master out. Uh, one thing. Yes. Uh, ma'am, in uh, UART, as you. Uh, UART. Ma'am, okay, ma yes. UART, ma'am, it's a single wire, although it is shown like an IC. For example, like there are not 9 plus 1 plus 2. So there are not 12 different lines, just one single line, and the yes, yes. data is sent one after the other. Yes, data is, uh, you are sending the data in the form of a frame, data frame. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That okay. I yes. yes. The yeah, single communication is shown that uh, form of data is in that form of data frame. Okay. So, next. So, that was your question, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, you can see here in uh, this SPI protocol, what we have, we have master out slave input. Okay. Or master input slave output. That means when your master is initiating uh, the transmission, then this is a dedicated pin for that. The That output is going to a particular dedicated pin. When master input slave output, that means the slave is initiating the transmission it is going to a particular pin. That way, data transmission is taking. This is 
unlike um, uh, URT, this is having the concept of clock. So it is clock synchronized. This one is for keep select. We will come into it. You first see this diagram, then I think keep select or slave select also you can. So we talked about this master and slave. We have also seen that when we have single master or slave communication, maybe master is, uh, is sending some communication through this channel, slave is receiving and that is done. But only single slave and single master communication, it is not sufficient. For that, this protocol is not defined. You are also defining how you, we can actually connect with multiple sleeves. At that point of time, there is a concept of you have to select the sleeves. I mean, which sleeves you are actually selecting for that you have some pins or bits dedicated. So if this maybe SS1 is enabled, then you are only selecting this slave one, raise two are disabled. That means whatever data is going through that MOSI, MOSI, uh, that line, that is dedicated for that slave one. So that way we are actually considering with these addition of few pins or few bits, we are actually, that is, the, these bits are acting as some keep select to select which slave you want to talk. So Mosi and Miso you have um, understood, I think. So this is the steps. So master first outputs the clock signal because you have seen that this is the clock synchronized. So this clock is going. And the master switches are then keep select or slave select pin. And based on that, if this is high, that indicates that master is, uh, uh, I mean, trying to uh, communicate with these particular slave, slave zero, slave one, slave two, whatever it may be. And then you are sending the data frame. So data in this way, MSB first. Like if you want to say send seven, then you have to, uh, you are considering the binary of seven and then you are sending the MSB first and LSB last. Okay. So this is the basic way of communication. Now this, you can see this here, this master in slave out. That means mostly these pin based communication is getting used when you are expecting some acknowledgement. Maybe sometimes when slave is initiating some communication or during the course of communication, this can be used uh, to send the acknowledgement from slave to master slide, um, side to, um, I mean, to confirm the, okay, you know, the data or the frame has been received. So, uh, of course, you can see the clear advantage over URT that slave addressing, you are handling, you are capable of multiple slaves, but slave handling is very easy with some few handling of some few pins or few bits, okay? Then we will come to I2C here. We have not discussed, so you can understand the, why the data transfer rate is more or less, okay? So there is no start and stop bits. Of course, this they have written this as an advantage, but you can understand that the start and stop bit is not required here. Why? Because this is clock synchronized. You are already using uh, this SE, uh, I mean S clock for the synchronization purpose. But in UART, we had to use that start and stop bit. Otherwise, your receiver will never understand from where it should synchronize and from where it will actually start reading the data. So that for that purpose, the start and stop bit was used in ERT. But here there is no purpose. So we are not using it. We are just using the clock, clock to do the synchronization. But what are the disadvantages? So this advantage here is we are using uh, four. Wait. We are using four ways. That means number of variants are increasing, number of calls are increasing, and it is getting complex to handle when you are actually using this protocol. 
So this is uh, this is not fully correct because no acknowledgement that had the data has been successfully received. Yes, well, the if in direct way it is not there, but obviously we can use our that slave out slave output master input that pin to send some added acknowledgement. Okay, but this is very important. Okay, this is very important that in UART. Um, now what we have seen, we have added some parity bit. That is very important in case of error checking. At least receiver will get the idea that whether your data is modified or not in the due course of communication. But here, in case of UART, you can see there there is nothing such parity or error checking related. No bits are used. Okay. Another one is that only single master you can use. So this is, I think now you can easily understand. I'm not uh, going to this. This is for SPI where it is connected to single slave or it is connected to multiple slaves. Okay. Next, with these advantages keeping in mind, we will see what improvement it was given in master and slave. Uh, sorry, in um, this communication, I2C communication. Okay. Inter IC communication or I do so. So in this master and slave, see you have this line LCL and SCL. So this is for clock and HDL is basically the line to send and receive data. Okay. We will see more generalized diagram. Okay. Before that. See what is the frame we are using for that communication. Okay. This is the start. This is the address frame. Okay, first you see what we are doing, then we will come back to it so that it will be easy to understand why addressing is required here. Come into this. So this way, this is the basic structure of I2C, where your master is co connected to this HDA and HDL lines and also the slaves. So for that, that means you have to send, whenever you are sending the, some, the frame, you have to send some address information related to which slave you want to select, okay? Based on that, that particular slave will get activated and it will actually receive the data. And for that reason, that addressing is required. You can see here, the multiple slave communication is also possible when you are, the multiple slaves are connected, uh, sorry, multiple masters are connected. Of course, slave was there, multiple slaves are there, and they all are connected to HDA and HDL line. So the advantage, clear advantage over the previous protocol is that you were just using these two lines, so better handle. Wedding is better handled. But you are using multiple slaves as well as multiple masters. So now we will go back to the what is the what is the data frame we are actually transferring. Now I think it will be clear. Wait. Now you see this. Now this is the start frame. Okay. Because that will uh, give again the receiver the idea from where it will start to check. This is actually define some space that is you can consider as interframe space. If the, you are actually receiving multiple messages, you will get the idea, the receiver will get the idea from where I will start and check. Then this is the address frame. So you have seen that is a common line. Whenever you are sending the data, that is a common line. And when this message is getting placed in that line, every slave will check and see whether this address frame is matching with their own address. I mean, the output of this address frame from this seven or 10 bits is matching with their own address. If yes, they will accept the data. If not, they will not accept. They will just discard this message. Next, it is read or write bit. Maybe it is for reading or just writing to some slave. 
okay or it is just the master wants to read some data from the sleep okay next acknowledgement or um, uh, negative acknowledgement bit this is used mostly for the acknowledging purpose at that time that at this frame is used to from maybe from sleep to a particular master if you are sending the acknowledgement bit then this address frame is actually defining which master for which master you are sending this acknowledgement and otherwise uh, yes th that is the thing at that time these data frames they are not very meaningful otherwise for general purpose communication then this data frame is getting filled with if let's say in this way if a master is sending to read some data okay from a particular slave in that case this address frame will hold the address of the slave okay then it will send the information from this bit setting high or low that whether what the master wants to do with the slave whether it is trying to read some data byte if yes then which data byte then that frame that will given in these data frames okay if no if it is trying to write some bit then also it will set or reset this bit based on your protocol defined uh it will send the address where it wants to write so that way this frame will be given to the sdl line now when each of the slaves they are checking and they are checking with these address frame they are checking whether the address their own address is getting matched with the uh address given in this message if yes they are accepting otherwise they are discarding it once they are receiving the address they are checking this field next field whether the instruction is for read or write if it is for read they are checking from which address the master is interested to read so based on this data frame they are getting the address and then they are again modifying this message frame remember and they are placing the data here they are sending the acknowledge here when this acknowledgement bit of course there is no point of this reading uh, read or write bit that means only one thing can happen whether you are sending some instruction to read or write or you are sending some instruction to acknowledge or not acknowledge okay so there will be a change in this field and then this address frame will hold the address of the sender or the master uh, sorry address of the receiver where this bit this message will go i mean is intended to go. so that way this same frame is getting modified once it is coming from the sender with some particular instruction or master with some particular instruction or the same message frame is getting modified when it is going from um, any slave going back to the master so this is the basic idea how that stl line is getting modified i mean the messages in stl line is getting modified and uh, based on that how this master and slave uh, they are working okay so this is the step by step you can check later i mean how master is starting the communication and then sending um, send each slave 7 to 10 address bit and based on that it is i mean define see it is sending some address uh, bit sequence so based on that it is uh, getting the this slave is getting the idea master wants to communicate with this slave and not with the other slaves so whatever message it is sending that is be accepted by only this slave okay and the rest will take this so now we got the idea how this communication is taking place and for single master and for multiple master okay. now the advantage i think it is quite clear that it is only using two words multiple master and multiple slave support okay and also the this acknowledgement or negative acknowledgement gives a confirmation that it transfers successfully or not okay and it is less complicated less number of ways and everything is i mean but 
of course with this comp everything the complex support the data transfer is slower and size of that that is also limited uh, to 8 bits of course that is a uh, protocol for every protocol there is some limitation like for every protocol in general you have to limit the data bit uh, based on the requirement okay and more complicated hardware needed to implement than spi so these are few three very important protocols we have discussed that is used either in intra embedded system or inter embedded system communication another one usb protocol that we use in uh, what we have already mentioned that inter embedded system communication that is universal serial bus you can see there are different versions of it but i'm just going to explain the start of topology okay tired start topology what does it mean see when we use this usb communication maybe you all have used this you have connected usb uh, your um usb charger of your phone to your laptop and some other you, you, your arduino maybe who have handled the arduino the arduino with your pc so everywhere now it is usb this communication protocol is very dominant so here we are you know i hope about the start topology okay here this hub is connected to multiple peripheral devices okay this one this one this hub or the host device it is connected to a multiple peripheral devices and it may happen that peripheral device is directly communicating to a hub that if that was so direct it would have been a simple start topology start topology but here we are see some hierarchy or some tier where we can add more hubs which are basically they are directly connected to peripheral devices so this is a basic idea of how usb is communicating based on the start topology to multiple peripheral devices at a time so this is the basic usb communication and uh, of course for that you can you using that usb trans transfer you can do the control transfer you can uh, you can do the bulk transfer or interrupt transfer everything is possible so these are few basic these are uh, i mean the idea of few basic protocols how they are working and how the data transfer is taking place from sender to receiver and what are their respective advantages okay now we will go to more deeper into the um, actual protocol we want to discuss that is the can protocol is there any um, questions so far hello ma'am yes Ma'am, uh, type C O uh, USB 3.1. Uh, in which uh, why it has high tra tra data transfer rate other than the other USB ports, USB 3.0 and other. See the this one, right? Super smooth having data transfer. So these are all how you are actually improving the internal technology. okay so this is the latest version and you are actually uh, improving the internal technology and that way you are also improving the speed and the data transfer rate that's all okay the basic uh, what are we, what are we doing for improving this pardon can you come again i'm not ma'am i am telling what are we doing for improving the speed okay for that you have to understand the underlying technology okay if you are inter interested i will share a document about it for that the, i mean this is the topology is same here in the networking communication we are talking about the tep to um, topology but it is the speed improvement or the that i mean uh, Oh, not only speed improvement. Whenever we are talking about speed improvement in this design, and or the power or those type of size improvement in IC, those everything comes from the underlying 
arch architecture or design part we are not discussing here at this point but if you are interested i will share that with you okay 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 i will come to you okay okay so now i think you have some idea about this uh, this inter system and inter, inter system based protocol basics how they work and how they are communicating now we will discuss the um, one of the most important uh, protocol that nowadays we heavily use in um, in our communication in general communication embedded communication or mostly in automobile automobile automotive domain and in different other domains also can is in different domains okay so can means controller area network so if you think about the again the smart car communication okay where you have multiple ecus you can think you can think these nodes multiple ecus of your car when there was no can the communication was like this that was not fully structured that was every node was communicating to every one so it was difficult to manage this communication and it was of course the if there's no one intermediate node failure and then understand that may affect the some other peripheral nodes where with can this is everything based on a single common line so you can see this all nodes are connected to this single line single master line maybe uh, backbone line you can think these issues or nodes in general i mean in case of smart cars you can think about the example of issues or in general these are the can nodes they are connected to this uh, basic uh, uh, what to say basic backbone line and communication is taking place through them now what is a clear advantage you can see if let's say this node 2 it is not functioning properly you can directly remove this uh, node from this line or you can set for some time you can set this uh, node off in the off stage you can actually remove this node for some time from your uh, total network now you can understand that will not affect much because these are just directly connected to this backbone lines so these will not affect the the performance or the working of other nodes but this type of flexibility was not there when we are talking about this without can scenario okay. now next question is how do when we are talking about this can module based communication you can see every node is connected to the same bus and also we will see when we will talk about the um, i mean data communication what type of messages one node is passing to other we will see no specific address field is there so the question is then how the nodes communicate that means if this node one is sending some message maybe see for only to node 3 and node 5 then how that node 4 2 and node 4 will understand whether i should accept that message or i should discard that message okay so we will see this later but just i wanted to tell mention that there is no typical dedicated addressing technique that whatever some in some previous protocols you remember we have seen something like we are having some address fields embedded in our message frame right few 7 to 10 bits we are dedicating that these fields i will say one or zero something like that i mean i will manipulate to actually show what is my destination but in case of can there is no requirement for that because can is in the each node it is associated with some transceiver type of thing so those 
they are basically controllers in such a way for each and every mess message these node that particular module in this node they check whether that module node is based on some specific id whether that type of message is uh, be important for that a particular node or not that means it is typically based on the message id type of message any node will accept or reject any message it is not that any address field is associated with the message which are, which are passing through this canvas and that is defining which node which is the destination node of that message so that way this can basically works some in a broadcasted way any node is broadcasting the message to everybody and based on the type of the message the all the nodes will either accept or reject the message this is one thing another interesting feature is that uh, i mean this is mainly because to reduce inductive spikes to reduce errors and to make your uh, communication noise free more reliable can is very effective and use some specific feature one feature is this one see here for any what to say communication you are not only sending one particular voltage level no the difference between two voltage levels that's why there are two lines that is one is called can high and another is called can low now different this can high line you can see goes to 3.75 and can low drops to 1.25 now based on these difference the based on this this differential voltage the can communication takes place so what is the advantage the advantage is that due to the whenever you are considering this difference as a particular state maybe it is dominant or maybe it is recessive state in that case it is not that if your one like in other cases maybe this is your zero or this is your one if some noise is actually affecting these voltage level may change and maybe the receiver get the impression that okay you are sending actually zero bit so this is when you are typically using particular voltage level then your communication may be more error prone on the contrary to increase the reliability to increase uh, i mean um, to decrease the sensitivity against some inductive spikes this type of concept of such differential voltage or voltage differential is used in case of cam okay so that way when you are actually defining we are we will be not telling okay zero level or one level we will be talking whenever we will be talking about cam we will be talking about dominant voltage or dominant state dominant level that is the dominant differential voltage and recessive level recessive voltage or recessive state okay so never uh, think that this dominant mean here one okay voltage whether it to maybe uh, something that you do one high voltage or low voltage nothing like that that is the differential voltage on which we are working on okay now you have the idea of um, that osi model we already talked about here we are also i mean dividing the functionality of can in three different layers mostly that is the object layer next the transfer layer next the physical layer object layer means what whenever you are having getting some data from your application layer that means you are writing some application maybe some mail or some code base some some application the data is coming how you are modifying that data how you are actually filtering that message or updating that me message to be suitable enough to process to the next level and that is the functionality of object layer 
Next, we are coming to the transfer layer. And here, I'm not going to these functionalities because these each of the functionalities, we will take one by one and we will see what is happening in this transfer layer. We will see those in detail. Okay. Next, we are coming to this physical layer. Let's consider this here. We are just modifying that, um, adding some features, modifying some features to those messages the, and then we are sending them to this physical level where we are just representing the bit representations like some if i have to send some one zero one one some this type of data how i will represent that the way based on the way i have already defined this can high or can low voltages so this is like mapping my message to the signal level and that way doing the signal transmission physical level transmission okay so if i'm i'm interested to send this type of 1010 some sequence of messages how i will map that to this particular signal convention that i'm using in the cam so that part is taken care by physical layer okay. so these are the few layers so now here we will do we will discuss these are the few properties what we see in can we will discuss one by one and we will see the whether we have completed everything in this list or not before that we will see how this message transfer is taking place in can so this is the data frame as we have seen in previous conventions also there is a data frame and we will see what are the fields present in the data frame or data frame of this of a can message so this is the start of frame which is similar to that start bit we have seen that is useful for synchronization then this arbitration field this arbitration field is important for define the message type as well as the message priority we will see in detail how we are going to use this arbitration field to handle the bus arbitration. Bus arbitration means when multiple nodes in the CAN, CAN line actually sending some message, and trying to send some message. Who will get the access to the bus and how we are defining the priority? We will use this arbitration field and we will see. Next, the control field. Control field means it defines how much amount of data because can nodes are very can sorry can message frames are very flexible you can send very small bytes of data or up to a certain limit you can send a particular a few bytes of data also so what is the valid size of data present in this data frame so this control frame is giving the size of data not the actual data next the data field this is giving the actual data that you are in you, you are planning to send from the sender node to the receiver node, then CRC. Okay. CRC, CRC field, you just know that this is for error checking. We will come to this part. I mean, the what do we mean by CRC when we discuss about error checking or error handling in next day? Okay. Then this is acknowledgement field and this is the end of frame. Okay. So this is the basic frame structure of CAN. Now we see what we mean by the arbitration field. Okay. So arbitration field basically consists of some identifier. Okay. Identifier is related to the ID of the message. Remember I talked about that whenever you are, any node is sending the message in the CAN bus, the receiver node actually checks whether the message id is useful for them or not this is one thing another thing is this arbitration field we will use for some message priority setting we'll come with an example then this is for rtr this is for remote transmission request that means when any receiver initiates some transmission it is not sending any value any data but it is requesting some data to come from another node that's all so for that is called a remote transmission request and for that 
this bit is set high and this is a field related to that beam of transmission. Okay. Then the control field. We will see one by one. This control field, see, this is some reserve bits associated with it. And then the this is the data length code. That means, as I told, that CAN frame is very much flexible. Okay. If you want to say, okay, I want all four bytes of data. Or I then you will say set this zero, I mean or one byte of data. You can set zero 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 one that way. Okay. Or if you want to say two bytes of data, zero zero one zero. So the way you will set the, the values bits in this code fields, that number of bytes actually you are sending in your data field. So next comes the data field, okay? Now see how we are using, whenever we are trying to send the data, how this identifier is helping us to understand which node, if there is a competition, if all these three nodes, they are trying to send the data to the CAN bus, what will happen? In this CAN bus, you can see this is the identifier field. Okay. Here you see the identifier up to this part 0, 9, 8, 7. This is similar for all. Okay. Now, according to the convention, the node will, which is having the dominant bit first will have the priority that means whenever there is a strong toggle from high state to this low state whichever node is having this toggle they will be uh, considered as higher priority for example here you see node one node two node three you see up to six clock cycle everything is same okay now come to the fifth clock cycle Fifth clock cycle for node one, there is a toggle from high state to low state. Okay. For node two, there is no toggle. That means, and node three, there is a toggle. That means, in this case, in this fifth uh, clock cycle, node two is already losing the competition. Node two's priority is given high. It is the priority is set high. Uh, sorry, priority is set low in the competition and node one and node three they are leading now. Okay. Now come to fourth state. So node two is already you have cancelled in two. It is getting cancelled here. Now the competition who will get the bus is between node one and node three. Okay. Here you see first clock cycle four and 3. Okay. Node 1 is high, node 3. Both are high. Okay. Next you come to this clock cycle 2. Here you see the node 1, This uh, there is no toggle in this clock cycle 2. But in node 3, there is a toggle from high to low. And that way, this node 3 is gaining the, I mean, the priority. It is the, of high priority. And it is getting the access of this control bus. See, there is no data in this, these two um, data fields. I mean, these data fields are not going to the actual bus. So these bus levels are actually taking the data information from node 3. Okay, control field and data field information from node 3. So this is the way this priority application takes place. So is it clear or should I repeat it once again? Just tell me. Ma'am, one, uh, one time please repeat. Huh? Pardon? Ma'am, please repeat uh, the part that after why, why these are not toggling. Uh, this green no, color. it is not a, why it is not toggling. That is what you have said in your hour uh, set in your identifier field. Like whenever that node one, node two, node three are there releasing, they are setting some priority and associated with it. Okay, so that is set. 
that is the message what type of message id and the identifier field that each node has say that is fixed but fixed means not uh, static i'm telling that is the nodes whenever they are generating those messages they have fixed it now all these three messages are coming all these three nodes are fighting to get the control of the bus now the question is who will i mean how the bus will decide or how the general i mean central controller will decide to who it will actually give the bus who will send its control and data field to the bus okay so that decision is taken by this identifier field sorry so what the central controller will check it will check who is having the first toggle from high to low state so initially you can see up to six state six clock cycle everything is same no change in fifth state fifth clock cycle node one and node three they are actually toggling okay then four three then then node two is already out of the race there is no question that no, now it is known that node two will not get the uh, bus at at that time it node two will wait till the node I mean, the higher priority uh, nodes. Ma'am, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. I get get the that point. Uh, ma'am, I only asking that uh, is this is fixed that this must not toggle after this certain time. Yes, this time. is fixed. That that okay. is that way. The identifier is fixed from that particular node. Maybe that is some way predefined. Okay, there are two things that make it. some way some nodes priority it, it is known that see whenever you are pressing a brake or whenever some input is coming from your media issue okay it is always fixed that your what you are doing with your brake or steering those nodes will have some high priority compared to your media related issue because that is some low priority node that is one thing and some cases some nodes they handle some real time um what to say a, a real time um, uh, messages they maybe they are sending or maybe sending some routine messages so according to that that no particular node will set the identifier in that way if it is a real time node of course the node will set the priority in the identifier in such a way that it will get the bus first so that they will actually um, they will not miss the real time deadline they will the priority is set low means a priority arbitration field most of the uh, uh, bits are set low means they will expect that they will get the bus level quickly and that real time timeline will get me i mean they will get satisfied so that is the idea so it is almost predefined or sometimes node decide that what type of message it is sending clear yeah, yes ma'am yes okay so this is the one of the important feature of can arbitration where based on setting these way the dynamic priority they actually handle the real time requirement over the routine functionalities that's why maybe one of the reason can is so popular due to this type of smart features can is so popular in this type of uh, real time embedded uh, communication systems so th this is the idea of priority arbitration the next one important concept i will tell about uh, can is how they handle the error for that there is typically a separate error frame now the way you are arranging the one or zeros in a message frame is not same as this error frame and if there is some error if there is some error occurs or maybe some receive sender is detecting some errors in their communication they raise a error frame error frame now you can see the data frame and this error frame this error frame is few collection
combination of few same level of bits. Okay. So the basic structure of error frame and the data frame, it is typically different. You remember when we talked about this data frame, you can go back, you can see there is some start of frame, then some arbitration field, some control field. So there are some, I mean, variation. Compared to that, when we are talking about error frame or this error frame is raising error flags, they consist of six consecutive dominant bits or passive error flag, six consecutive recessive bits. So in can there is a concept of bit zapping, uh, bit stuffing that sees that you cannot use few consecutive bits. So there is some limitation. How many consecutive bits you can use at a time in a general frame? If you have to use more than that, you will add a reverse bit in uh, within that, and then you will again start your actual data. That is a general strategy or general structure of a uh, what is a data frame. In case of error frame, this is different. And when all the bits, all the nodes, they see some frame is coming with some six consecutive same bits, maybe dominant, maybe recessive, they will understand this is related to some error flag or error frame. Okay. Now the can is having another very smart feature that is called fault confinement. Now you see, we are telling that CAN is having this error frame. Okay, that means whenever there is an error is, um, I mean, there is a possibility of error, any node is generating some error frame. Maybe this, um, th there is some total failure of some node, uh, some uh, hour, I mean, uh, very, what you say, congestion in the node, congestion in the uh, overall system, and some node is detecting this congestion, it is checking that, okay, my frame is not getting delivered to my destination node. That means there is some error. Let's raise a one error frame. In that way, this thing will go on. And you can see that these multiple generation of error frames uh, continuously, that will, uh, I mean, make the situation worse if there is some situation of congestion more and more error frames are getting added to your congestion and that is continuously getting added so there is no solution it will that condition will never get resolved and that may lead to some system fault system failure to avoid this as we have already discussed there the concept of state transition can also use these type of concept of state transition where they have actually this is a state transition diagram where can defines three types of states one is error active another is error passive another is bus off what does it mean can gives some counters associated with the error one is receiver error counter and another is transmitter error counter transmit error counter or send from the center. So whenever some error is getting detected and error frame is generating, these counters are getting increased. But there is a threshold. If this counter is initially, when uh, any node is detecting some error is occurring and it is generating some, um, what to say, error frame, it is in the error active state. Okay. Now you understand whenever, if the situation is not getting, uh, I mean, the problem is not getting resolved of the error or for the condition or maybe some bash failure or maybe node failure, whatever may be. This error will increase and increase. This counter values will increase and increase. So now if this REC value is greater than 127, or this TEC value is greater than uh, 127 and less than 255. These are just numbers. But the idea is they are actually defining some threshold of this REC value, how much these counters will increase. 
if it is actually increasing up to a, a certain threshold, this node will ch change its state to error passive state. What does it mean? At that time, it will detect some error, but it will not initiate any uh, frame generation. Okay, so that it will try to at least diminish the congestion or the, uh, I mean, uh, failure scenario in the overall system. That way, there are two possibilities. That if one state is going to, to the error passive state, it may happen that this counter again getting decreased. Okay. There is some successful con congestion is getting solved. Some succession, the successful transmission is getting is taking place and your TEC value is decreasing. So it is decreasing and it is decreasing um, down the threshold and this error passive state will again change its state to this interactive state. Okay. But on the other hand, if that is not happening, if still the error is getting, I mean, um, it's a, a, a error counter is increased by other nodes and this value is getting increased. This TEC is getting, it's greater than 256. That is another threshold number. Then this node will be in the bus of state. Bus of state means that, I mean, a uh, node will totally disconnect from the bus line for some time, okay? Again, when it is from the bus of state, when it is again after some reset, maybe at that time some system hardware reset or some external intervention is required to change the situation. And when that is done, this bus of state will again start from the error active state. Error active state means whenever it will detect some error, possibility of error, it will generate one error frame that we have discussed in this uh, this type of error frame. And with this type of active error flag, that is, uh, again, it is broadcasting that active error flag in this error frame that all the other nodes will come to know there is some error happen in this CAN network. So this is the, this state diagram defines how the fault confinement the self-sustained uh, scenario in CAN, where it is confining the fault with the help of these state trans transition, it is either it is again going back to the general normal interactive state, or it is totally removing any node can totally remove itself from the CAN bus line and take some time, wait for some hardware reset or some other type of uh, reset to get the situation, uh, to wait for the better situation, and then it come back and start the transmission, or it can come back and take part in the transmission or receiving. So this concept is called fault confinement, where with this change of states, a node itself is trying to minimize the effect of error trying to confine the effect of error or effect of fault within itself. So that's why it is called the fault confinement property of CAN. These are the two very, I mean, smart properties. One is fault conf confinement, how it is, I mean, this is useful for ensuring reliability and also the, the previous one, what we have discussed about the message arbitration, how the priority is getting set and handled by message bus, I mean CAN bus. So this is the concept of fault confinement. I mean, just go through it. You have any doubt? Again, I will discuss that. There is another one is overload frame. Overload frame means this is nothing else. If some condition happen and some uh, what do you say? Receiver is um, uh, uh, getting the idea. Some sender is already sending the data, sending the message frame, but there is a possibility of congestion. Then there is these type of overload frames. They can request that give some delay to in the next data frame. 
that means requesting from delay or in intermission that means intermission means i will go back here and i will show you this interframe space see there is some space there is some defined voltage level for after the end of one frame and the start of the next frame uh, and between the end and start of two frames so if there is a, a mismatch anomaly in that intermission voltage level detection of dominant bit then also this overload frame uh, refers that there is some problem with whatever frame is coming so just we send that frame okay. so these are the different frame types that helps and the different strategies like fault confinement that uh, bus arbitration so um, priority checking based on that we set check what are the properties we are satisfying in tan protocol see first thing was is the prioritization of messages we have checked how we are doing that in with the help of bus arbitration okay that in turn is giving the guarantee of latency times okay that is there are two ways one is that high priority node the way it is setting the arbitration field it is guarantee it is uh, giving a guarantee that it will get the the bus first and there is no unwanted delay the second thing is that with the users of fault confinement if there are some error happens to ensure reliability there is a this technique of this fault confi of confinement technique ensures that some node is capable of removing itself from the bus so in spite of the fact some problem is happening for that node if it removing from the bus that ensures that at least worst case if you do the worst case time analysis you can guarantee some latency time configuration or uh, uh, flexibility that you know need to give some fixed address any of the nodes whoever actually thinking that this type of message id is required for to for the next level operation they can accept it multicast reception we have seen we are broadcasting in to all the nodes and they are the receiving nodes they are choosing their own messages and data consistency multi master that means one node not only one node any node can be mastered and based on their priority they can get hold of the bus then we have talked about error detection and signaling we have seen how that fault confinement states and we the use of error frames any node can detect error whenever it is detected it can actually signal it can actually broadcast the error frame to all the nodes that okay see this is the signal some error has happened to the network okay automatic with transmission of corrected message when the bus is idle so whenever we are any node is coming from the bus idle state to the active error state this type of automatic with transmission is possible and finally distinction between temporary errors and permanent failures that means see when you the any node is moving from active state to the passive error state that means it is waiting to check whether the failure is temporary or not based on the counter values whenever it is checking that okay the counter values the tc the transmission uh, error count is actually going beyond a certain threshold it is considering that as permanent failure and it is removing that particular node is removing itself from the canvas so that is that time it is considered as a permanent failure and that is require the external intervention maybe some hardware reset so that way that type of switching from um, normal error state to some temporary error state and to some permanent failure and again coming back to the active error state that is possible due to this uh, fault con uh, con con confinement state diagram so that way it is better suitable in in terms of reliability and to handle defective defective nodes 
So these are the different, these are the few properties present in CAN. And I hope whatever we have discussed from there, it is uh, we, we, we can get an, some idea that how these properties, these improvements that we promised in CAN is getting guaranteed. Okay. So this is a very basic, maybe I say, idea about CAN. Uh, you can go, sorry. You can go through this following references. Basically, I have taken this. This is a taken this uh, information about this can from this uh, Bosch Bosch specification, and uh, also there are some other sources materials are there in the drive link. You can check. So this is a very basic idea about can. Uh, please go through it and let me know if you have any question or any part you want me to. I mean discuss again okay so that's all for today from my part are you there yes, okay Anything else you want to ask? Otherwise, I'm stop. I'm stopping here. Okay. Any more questions? Otherwise, you can log off. Thank you.